So I would suggest that um, there are two major challenges to this way of thinking that assumes that the materiality of sex is linked to reproductive function. First of all, not all sexed bodies are reproductive, which is to say that some people are not yet of an age where reproduction is possible. Some people are past the age when reproduction is possible. Some people were never capable of reproduction and others never wanted to reproduce and have led lives without reproducing and are very happy. Are we to say that that whole population of everyone I just named is not sexed? <laughs> Given this multiplicity of embodied positions in relation to the cultural mandate of reproduction, can we say that it's necessary, even ethically obligatory, to conceive of the sexed body outside the framework of reproduction? After all, sexual reproduction is only one way of organizing and understanding the sexuality of the body. If reproduction becomes the only framework within which we think the sexed body and its materiality, defining all its possible constituent elements in light of their possible or actual reproductive function, then what have we done? We have ruled out the possibility of a sexed body and a sexual life that has no relationship to reproduction. And if we enlarge the paradigm of sexuality within which we think the sexed body, does that sexed body appear differently? In other words, which organs are now sexed? And how do we think of both sexuality and the sexed body outside the framework in which its very materiality um, is conceptually constrained by the reproductive function. And what are we talking about when we say its very materiality is conceptually constrained by the reproductive function? We're saying its matter is defined by what matters about it. We have only to look to the history of science to see that the very definitions of sex have changed throughout the centuries. And that even now historians of science have spirited arguments about how to identify sex determining genes, to what extent the genes are determinative of sex, whether they're only determinative in interaction with other kinds of physiological or hormonal elements. International athletic associations argue about testosterone levels that establish someone as capable of competing in women's sports, and they have big debates. Um, and we can think about the case of Castor Semenya from a few years ago. Those hormonal levels vary quite significantly among women. Sometimes they raise the question of whether someone identified socially as a woman can compete in women's sports. There are chromosomal variations as well that affect up to 10% of the population. So that's hardly a clear criterion for sex determination. We surely do say, or at least most of us say, that there are material differences between the sexes, but at the moment in which we talk like that, we're always implicitly referring to one historical version of materialism or another. In other words, we do not deny the generality of those material differences, even though, given the variations and exceptions and the importance of intersex, it would be a mistake, even a form of cruelty, to call that difference between the sexes universal. Even at this most obvious moment, the one in which we declare the reality and materiality of two sexes and everybody feels much better, right, because we've just made it obvious, we're already in a discursive field disputing what we mean and which meaning ought to prevail, because we could all agree that there are two sexes and those differences are material and we could end the conversation there. But the minute I start to ask you, and by the way, where do you locate that materiality? How do you describe it? The minute we start that, we tend to be not on common ground. Maybe some common ground, maybe not. Actually, what we are in those moments, we're in history. <laughs> in other words, we're working with historical discourses that are available to us and seem very obvious. 
Finally, I think that the empirical sciences that seek to establish the body as a discrete empirical phenomenon, one that can be studied as an isolated entity, sometimes fail to understand the body as a living being or to distinguish adequately between ways of living, even ways of dying. If the body, um, and if a body is living, as I suggest, it's living in some way, already embedded in cultural relations, in historical discourses. Indeed, can we know the life of the body without understanding in what way it's living? If the body is only treated as a positive and discrete entity, measurable, verifiable, we can gain certainty about its existence. We can even do a medical diagnosis if we're trained to do that. Um, but what we've done with the body is reduced it to a materiality that conforms with a positivist way of seeing. Have we at that moment lost sight of the relationships in which the body exists, which allow the body to exist, the relations without which no body can exist? What if the body is a dynamic field of relations, always dependent and interdependent, what if the body is aging, living, falling in love, falling ill, dying and, or dead? What if it's recovering or flourishing? Does it matter which modality that living being is in when we talk about the life of the body? How do we understand that temporal dimension of embodied life if we remain restricted by the positivist account of the body as a material fact? It's true that we name the body differently depending what discourse we use, depending what language we speak, what purpose we want that body to serve, or what social significance it may have. And indeed, reproductive uh, functions are, are part of the dominant ways in which we order bodies, at least in relationship to sex. Perhaps what we call the body's materiality is what constantly escapes whatever name we might give it. There is no one name for the body. So whatever the body is, it is never captured by any particular name. Is it there, elusive, persistent, and yet finally, uh, what may be most uncapturable by discourse? This is not a way of denying that the body exists. On the contrary, it's a way of saying that no matter how adamant we are in our claims to know and seize and verify and produce the material body, we are bound up in a discourse that cannot claim to be the only way to understand what a body is, what a sexed body is, and how it means. Bodies live on, sometimes as a living being, sometimes not, and we seek to give a name to that which can never be fully or finally named. The body, perhaps, is the name for our conceptual humility, the limit of our conceptual schemes. Perhaps it is the site of our linguistic failing. Oh, why do we concern ourselves with such theoretical questions? What brought you out of the beautiful sunny day into this dark cavern to listen to this? One reason is that we are concerned with how women, gender non-conforming people, sexual minorities who hurt no one, are regularly misrecognized or unrecognized. When one lives as a body that suffers misrecognition, perhaps insult or harassment, cultural prejudice, economic discrimination, police violence, or psychiatric pathologization, that leads to a de-realized way of living in the world, a way of living in the shadows, not as a human subject, but as a phantasm, someone else's phantasm, but you're living it. And yet, we see that through social movements that seek recognition and enfranchisement, con communities of LGBTQI people have emerged from the shadows, making visible and audible their lives, lives that have the same rights as any other to love and lose, to celebrate and to mourn. Of course, we seek recognition in this world in order to exist as social subjects participating in a common world, 
At the same time, we know that there is no perfect recognition in this world. That does not mean that we stop struggling for recognition, but only that we must understand that recognition is precisely an ongoing struggle. We ask for recognition not only for who we are, but for our very capacity for self-determination, our claim to equality and to freedom. How do bodies that have been living in the shadow zones emerge into a brighter light, maybe not full illumination, but still a brighter light? They do this, I would suggest, in solidarity with one another, not as heroic individuals. But still, if we live in a world in which bodies are only understood within conventional norms of gender, or when those who are excluded from society are understood as the non-civilized, then how do such lives become visible and audible under such conditions? How can bodies be recognized when they do not fit the social norm of what bodies should be, what acts of agency are necessary to counter the forces of exclusion and derealization, but also violence? How do bodies gather together to signify their common existence, their intelligibility, and their persistence? Sometimes it's in the very act of standing forth, of walking together, of gathering, that asserts a social existence, signifies a political demand, and promises a different political future. Although much of my own thinking has been concerned with feminism, gender politics, and sexual rights, I think it is important to see how the question of who can be recognized extends to many populations. Indeed, it extends to ever greater numbers of people who now live precarious lives. Such questions come alive when precarious populations gather to protest austerity measures, to protest unjust and racist immigration laws, to protest the increasing conditions of temporary and dispensable labor and exploitation, the profound sense of there being no future, the burden of unpayable debt, the fear of authoritarian regimes, social and police violence. People assemble together not only to voice their opposition to policies that make their lives unlivable, but also sometimes simply and emphatically to stand to stand together in public, more illuminated than before, to draw attention to those specific bodily lives that suffer when shelter is not available, when food sources are unequally distributed, and when basic sustenance and health care is not accessible and not affordable. They do time and again stand together when their very presence on the street sends a certain shockwave through society, as if to say, we, the invisible ones, we exist. This happens in several countries, most countries, when people stand and move in public who are transgendered, queer women, who are undocumented citizens, members of unprotected religious minorities, racial minorities, the precarious. Although there's always a risk of being harassed or hurt or killed when they assemble, as we, as we have seen in many of the major demonstrations in Europe, in Turkey, in Russia, and recently in Iguala, Mexico, uh, 